And now they're you know, rewriting history to falsify the moon landings. It was so dangerous that we couldn't have passed through it because we're still trying to solve the problem of how to pass through it at all. Effective shielding is quite beyond engineering feasibility in the near future. Moon landing conspiracies have been a thing ever since the Americans first landed there in 1969. Nice. One less popular but still unintelligible theory is that humans not only never went to the moon, they couldn't have even gotten there. <laughs> Why, sheeple? Because doing so would mean traveling through deadly space radiation. This is the Van Allen Radiation Belt Conspiracy. Now entering the facility. First of all, I know that many of my colleagues have already tackled this topic. Phil Plate, Vintage Space, and a channel that seems to post the same videos after I post them. But me being me, today I want to focus on the radiation part of this radiation-based conspiracy. Once we understand that, you will understand exactly why this makes about as much sense as constantly platforming less than serious people to tens of millions of listeners. But they are just asking questions. No, they are not, Arya. No, they are not just asking questions. The just asking questions routine is a way to intentionally weaponize ignorance by constantly asking basic questions that are hard to answer in real time. Questions like, how exactly did we get to the moon? Say it in five seconds or less. And then using the fact that an expert can't do that unreasonable request in an unreasonable amount of time as evidence that experts know nothing. And then they use that to intentionally sow distrust and disdain for expertise, science, institutions, the intellectual work as a whole, and they use that as a way to sell workout supplements to low effort thinkers. But what if it is aliens? Don't start with me, Aria. A decade before Apollo 11, the very first US satellite was launched from Florida. Instrument chief James Van Allen had Geiger counters put on it. He wanted to study the nature of cosmic radiation, especially the stuff that was normally blocked by Earth's atmosphere. He didn't find what he expected. The radiation rate was normal near Earth, but starting at around 1,000 kilometers up, the measurements were going absolutely ham for real, for real, no cap. So much so that the measurements had to be stopped. Within a year, another satellite would find another band of radiation further out. These were dubbed the inner and outer Van Allen radiation belts after the instrument chief. It shouldn't surprise you, NASA being NASA and all, that the discovery of these belts was immediately recognized as a problem for the upcoming mission to the moon. You can find dire sounding quotes like this. We must solve these challenges before we send people through this region of space. This is what conspiracy theorists like this poor young man focus on. How do you explain that one, NASA? Contradiction. Yeah, NASA, how do you explain that? Well, NASA did explain it. You just asked a disingenuous question and stopped listening. NASA spent literally years trying to figure out how to send astronauts through a high radiation environment. James Van Allen himself even suggesting nuking the belts to disperse the radiation there. The Americans did end up nuking space for a different reason, but that's a story for another time. By 1964, NASA was confident that the Van Allen radiation belts, or VARB as I will call them now, were a relatively minor risk compared to everything else that could go wrong during a mission to the moon. And you will understand why VARB is a relatively minor risk when you understand the nature of the radiation itself. But how could the flag wave if there's no air on the moon? I don't, don't start with me, Ari. I'm not in the mood right now for that, okay? It's because there's reduced gravity and no air on the moon, and so any momentum you impart to the flag while you're screwing it into the lunar regolith is gonna have an outsized effect on the flapping of the flag, something that you might not expect. <sighs> Today's video is sponsored by Incogni. Chat, I'm award-winning science educator and noted personal space enjoyer, Kyle Hill. Doesn't it seem like there's a new data breach almost every single, do yep, 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 there's another one. Doesn't it seem like there's a new data, oh, Mm hmm Doesn't it seem like... Doesn't it seem like there's another data breach almost every single day? Your personal online information is at risk now more than ever. Yours truly has actually had to deal with identity theft not once, but thrice this year. The same year! That's why I use products like today's sponsor, Incogni. Incogni is a personal data removal service that finds data brokers across the internet and gets your precious information deleted from them. 
Unfortunately, the state of the web is that there are hundreds, if not thousands of data brokers out there that collect and sell your data without your consent. Incogni tracks down these online directories, people search sites, and commercial databases, and automatically sends removal requests to them for as long as your data appears there. To get started, all you have to do is create an account, share the bare minimum of personal information that you'd like to scorch Earth policy from the internet, and then authorize Incogni to remove it. They will legally and automatically contact hundreds of websites on your behalf. And if you know exactly where you don't want to be, Incogni also has a custom removal feature where all you have to do is give them a URL and they will get to work. Just this year, and this is true, I had some guy take out over $50,000 worth of loans in my name, which dropped my credit score by over 100 points in a single month. I actively use services like Incogni, the first and only personal data removal service independently verified by Deloitte, to make sure that never happens again. If the bad actors can't find you, they can't harm you. And that dude better hope I don't find him, cause I throw hands! If you want to remove your personal data from the internet, try going to Incogni right now for a risk-free 30-day trial and 60% off an annual plan like I have if you go to incogni.com forward slash Kyle Hill and use the offer code Kyle Hill. Incogni? More like incognito. Oh, <laughs> what? Oh, <laughs> not this time, data brokers. I have incogni. <laughs> Hair spin out! I know that it can be hard to visualize these things sometimes, so what I did is 3D print a model to show you everything that's going on out there in outer space. This is the magnetosphere. Imagine the sun is here and the solar wind comes screaming over here and impacts the magnetic field of Earth, which is generated via a dynamo-like effect with the spinning, moving metal core at the center of the Earth. Now the solar wind comes in here and because of the Earth's magnetic field, it gets attenuated like this into a sort of tail. You can also see that it gets sucked in to the Earth's magnetic poles because of how the charged particles interact with that magnetic field. But Kyle, I can't see anything inside that figure. Oh, bam! Didn't expect that, did you? Now remember, the sun is over here at the day-noon side, and the influence of the solar wind is making this shape. This shape also gets drawn in by the Earth's magnetic field, which is kind of like north and south magnets, so that charged particles get drawn into this shape as well, creating a plasma sheet inside of this tail, and more importantly for us, creating the radiation belts that we are talking about. Inside of the inner and outer radiation belts are those high energy electrons, high energy protons, and I'll point out that the International Space Station does actually travel through a low energy part of the inner radiation belt every so often. So if that was so much of a problem, why would it do that? Conspiracy theorists. Anyway, I like this model because it is yet another way to visualize all the crazy stuff that's happening with space weather and our magnetosphere. The solar wind coming this way, pushing the magnetosphere into a certain shape, coming back in on itself because of how the magnetic field lines are oriented to create a plasma sheet and, important for our purposes, radiation belts. This is... It, uh... It went better for Apollo. So, what is actually inside the VARB that makes conspiracy theorists think that space travel is literally impossible? Well, it begins with the sun. The heart of the solar system is a giant fusion reactor. As that reaction occurs, it releases an immense amount of energy. In the sun's atmosphere, that energy is enough to overcome gravity and fling away the plasma the sun is made of. These particles scream out from the surface of the sun in a million mile per hour stream that humans call the solar wind. The mostly protons and electrons in the solar wind and cosmic rays from space have an electric charge. So when they encounter the Earth's magnetic field, they are guided around it and trapped, much like the magnetic field in a tokamak reactor can trap plasma. This is how the Van Allen radiation belts are formed and maintained. The outer belt is mostly electrons, and the inner belt is mostly high-energy protons. 
high energy photons? That sounds like it makes space travel impossible. Hey, here are my supplements. I had to sell my studio because I'm a terrible person. A conspiracy theorist might say, but it actually does matter how much energy this specific kind of radiation deposits into matter over time. Again, NASA always knew radiation would be a problem, so it started developing detailed shielding and radioactive dose regulations. Following the radiation protection rule of time-distance shielding, even the earliest space missions had radiation shielding. On average, a shielded astronaut on a mission to the moon might get a dose of one millisievert per day in empty space. This is a pretty spicy rate compared to the places that I've been. The dose in the VARB is much, much higher. In this 1963 paper, the estimated highest rate in the inner belt was 5 rad per hour after shielding, or 50,000 microsieverts per hour. But like we said, the time matters a lot here. The Apollo astronauts would not spend all day in the spiciest part of the radiation belts. They would shoot straight through the lowest rate region that they could as fast as they could. Quote, these proton, electron, and X-ray dose rates will not constitute a radiation hazard for flights straight through the inner and outer belt in about two hours. Indeed, even in an intentionally spicy two-hour trip through the VARB at this rate, you would still be under the lowest acute radiation dose known to increase lifetime cancer risk. When the astronauts returned and their doses were tabulated via the many dosimeters they had with them, they hadn't received anywhere near the dose that would raise a conspiracy theorist's eyebrow. Scientists calculated that they had received 0.18 rad. Now, we will do a whole episode on what radiation units are and what they mean, why rads and sieverts measure something totally different, for example. But if we convert 0.18 rad to standard units and apply a weighting factor for proton radiation, astronauts flying through the Van Allen belts to the moon receive something like 3.6 millisieverts, which matches nicely with the estimated 1 millisievert per day rate and a three-day mission. And this was just at the level of their skin. It would be lower inside of their bodies. Now, if you stop here, like a conspiracy theorist might, this could still sound like a scary number. But this is actually about the same as the annual dose you receive just living in Texas. Houston, we don't have a problem. Understanding the topic that you're actually talking about happens to matter quite a bit. The first AI search result that I got when looking up this topic was wrong about the rates of radiation in the VARB by a factor of 1,000. What is to stop the average person from just thinking that's true? You, I guess. Yeah, I, I guess so, Arya, but I am, I'm just one man. What can man do against such reckless podcasting? Now, don't get it mistaken. If you took some unprotected astronauts and just plopped them in the VARB for a whole day, they would get a dangerous dose. But the nearly 400,000 people who worked on the Apollo program were not stupid enough to do that. They prepared, they measured, they protected. That's how you get someone all the way to the moon. You ask good questions and then work towards good answers. It's not rocket science, except in this case it is. Until next time. Now exiting the facility. Thank you so much to the very nerdy staff here at the facility for their direct and substantial support in the creation of this year's video. If you want to join the facility, if you want episodes early, if you want private live streams with me, if you want to see the Patreon exclusive podcast with ADEF and I, where we take only Patreon questions and it's free for you forever behind the blast doors, go to patreon.com forward slash Kyle Hill and join today. And hey, if you support us just enough, you get your name in every single video. And as you can see there's so many so many of you i don't know how i'm gonna pass the time it truly is one of the least interesting moon conspiracy theories i think there are probably ones that have better chances of being true i mean the shadow one oh they can't have multiple shadow angles with just the sun being there i mean that is kind of convincing at face value and this one is just kind of just like not getting it and I, I feel like that just comes from a general radophobia and not understanding radiation at all. You hear that there's a radiation belt, so you just assume you can't go through it? You have cosmic rays going through your, your belt right now. And you're fine. 
kind of. You might want to get that belt checked out. Thanks for watching.